Hello and welcome. Thanks for attending this Dallas Foundation remote talk. My name is Louis Kamiathi. My primary Dallas name is Shou Jing, Cultivating Stillness. With Kate Townsend, I'm the founding co-director and senior teacher of the Dallas Foundation, a nonprofit Dallas religious and educational organization dedicated to fostering authentic Dallas study and practice and to preserving and transmitting traditional Dallas culture. In the Dallas tradition, we refer to these types of meetings and talks as Lundao. Lundao literally means discussing the Tao, with the Tao being the sacred and ultimate concern of Taoists. It is a Dallas conversation about the Tao, Dallas practice realization, and or the Dallas tradition. It may be a formal discourse, something akin to a Zen Buddhist Dharma talk or a communal discussion. It may be an abbot's lecture, formal spiritual direction, and even drinking tea together. It's any meeting between Taoists because it's always about the Tao in some respect. Remembering the sacred, maintaining sacred orientation. In our approach, Lundao usually includes both a formal talk and more open discussion. For this second set of talks, I want to discuss some more technical topics, especially relevant for members of the Dallas Foundation and the larger global Dallas community, whether from an adherent or scholarly perspective. So I'm gonna share my screen with you. For this Lundao, I want to offer a radical rereading of the Tao Te Ching, the scripture on the Tao and inner power, especially as articulated in my recent Tao Te Ching, a contextual, contemplative, and annotated bilingual translation, which was just published about a month ago by Square Inch Press, which is the publishing branch of the Dallas Foundation. It's directly connected to my revisionist views and scholarship on Taoism. And for this, you can see our other online Lundaos and various publications. So we begin here with two paintings, two representations of two key figures in the kind of, especially the Western understanding of the Tao Te Ching. So these are paintings of Lao Tzu, Master Lao on the left, and James Legg on the right. And part of the reason to start with this is that this is the way a lot of people begin with engaging the Tao Te Ching. And this is really a twofold fiction. So the first part is the legend of Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu was a mythological, a legendary figure. Um, as far as we can tell, he didn't exist. He's a conflation of various legends. Um, and so what we're dealing with here as part of the kind of problematic understanding of the Tao Te Ching is that there's a single author and Lao Tzu as that attributed author. So thinking about the Tao Te Ching as a kind of um, single voice or single perspective, when in fact it's multiple perspectives and multiple voices that I'll talk about in a moment. So as received, this interpretive framework leads to various misinterpretations and misrepresentations of the Tao Te Ching. On the right is a portrait of James Legg. He lived from 1815 to 1897. He was a Scottish Protestant Christian missionary and Sinologist, so you might just kind of think about these representations um, as the figures, right, of who they are. So what is it that they're communicating to us? What is it that these representations want us to believe? Um, James Legg translated the text of Taoism in 1891 in the Sacred Books of the East series. He's a key figure in the Victorian construction or even invention of Taoism, quote unquote, that centers on so-called philosophical Taoism strike through and so-called religious Taoism strike through. This is what I refer to as the bifurcated, that is divided or Legian view of Taoism. And it's the primary received um, view or interpretive framework. It's really a fiction that's um, kind of in circulation and uh, popular discussions of Taoism, but also, in fact, non-specialist kind of academic and educational discussions of Taoism as well. So we should get rid of this and think about Taoism in a radically different way um, that I talk about explicitly in the Taoist tradition that was published in 2013 by Bloomsbury Academic. 
So most translations of the Tao Te Ching are in fact Legian. They're rooted in the false assumption of classical Taoism being philosophy, quote unquote, and specifically this kind of view of engaging the Tao Te Ching and classical Taoism as disembodied ideas and thought. One of the reasons that this happens and continues to be perpetuated is because it's easy to appropriate and domesticate, especially in educational settings. So if it's not about practice and it's not about experience and it's not about embodiment, then it's easier to kind of just look at it as a set of ideas that one can ruminate about. Um, to this, we could also add the Xuanxue, the Profound Learning School, especially Wang Bi's uh, commentary on the Tao Te Ching as the two primary ways in which the Tao Te Ching is constructed, especially in kind of Western presentations. So I just say here is that the ghost of leg still walks these halls, the way in which people are reading and understanding the Tao Te Ching, and also therefore translating and presenting the Tao Te Ching. In place of this, we can use what I refer to as the seven periods and the four divisions of Taoist history. I'm not going to go through this today. It's in some of the other talks. Um, but the seven periods really bring our attention to the historical periods of Taoist history, thinking about the way in which Taoism unfolded through different um, historical periods, through different dynasties, that there are certain kinds of patterns that one sees. Right? For example, in early Taoism or early medieval Taoism versus late imperial Taoism and so on. And then on the right is the four divisions, and that's really bringing our attention to uh, social organization. So classical Taoism, what we're looking at today, that's the movement or the period um, that, that the Tao Te Ching is associated with, is really characterized by master disciple communities that are loosely affiliated, but nonetheless connected. Early organized Taoism was the emergence of an actual organized tradition, um, eventually with enduring institutions. So you might know the Tian Shi, the Celestial Masters movement, but there were other movements at this time as well. But the kind of emergence of what we can talk about is actually an organized religion rather than a kind of religious community in classical Taoism. Later organized Taoism, there's a shift into monasticism. So you still have a strong householder tradition, but the monastic model becomes primary and dominant. And then there's a fluctuation back and forth between these two models. And then modern Taoism is characterized, especially on an institutional level uh, between Zhengyi Orthodox Unity, the householder tradition that's rooted in the earlier Tianxi Celestial Masters movement, and then Quanzhen Complete Perfection, which is the monastic order. So that's a story for another time. Here we're focusing on classical Taoism, and you can see the period and the division are the same. So Taoism as it's emerging in the late Warring States period and the early Western Han. So thinking specifically about the inner cultivation lineages of classical Taoism, this is the movement that the Tao Te Ching is associated with. And um, there's a separate talk that I've done on the inner cultivation lineages of classical Taoism, but just to give you a little bit of background information for thinking about the Tao Te Ching. So the inner cultivation lineages of classical Taoism are loosely affiliated master disciple communities from the late Warring States period to the early Western Han Dynasty, so the 4th to the 2nd centuries BCE. Um, we usually date this to around 350 BCE, which is the kind of tentative date of the Neya of inward training. And then into the 2nd century BCE, especially 139 BCE, the time that the Huainan, so the Book of the Huainan Masters, was submitted to the throne. But now I increasingly, if you look at the Tao Te Ching book, dated even later than this. So around 90 BCE is when I kind of um, put the end date um, and there are specific details and information on that in the book. The early, it's the earliest Taoist religious community and the beginning of the Taoist tradition. So I'll talk about in a moment why I think it's religious. But here I'll just say, because they're really focusing on meditation practice, specifically apophatic and quietistic meditation, aimed at mystical union and participation in the Tao. So we've just mentioned this, the sacred and the ultimate concern of Taoist. So it, there's a theologically infused contemplative practice that really is the root of this movement, the kind of assumed practice of the community. There are early designations, so these are um, self-referential terms used by members of the inner cultivation lineages. So the teachings beyond or without words, the way of the ancients, the way of the sages, and then even the technicians of the way. 
Um, so this is derivative from this emphasis on Tao Shu, the techniques of the way or the arts, uh, sorry, the techniques of the Tao or the arts of the way in uh, the Zhuang, so the Book of Master Zhuang. It's eventually known as the family of the way, Tao Jia. Um, so this is in the Shirji and the records of the historian. So around 90 BCE, when this term becomes kind of used as the designation for what we're talking about as classical Taoism. Um, it's also misrepresented and misinterpreted as so-called philosophical Taoism strike through, but this is a fiction. It did not actually refer to anything called philosophical Taoism. You can see in the term itself that what it's talking about is a family that orients itself and cultivates the Tao as the sacred and ultimate concern of Taoists. So the Jia here can function something like a school or a lineage. But we need to think through this conceptualization, this way that Taoists, and it's not, it's beyond Taoism too. Jiao was used more generally in this period to kind of um, frame different ways of understanding different communities and different traditions. So in this context, what they're really talking about is thinking about community and tradition through a family analogy or a family metaphor. What is our spiritual ancestry? What is our genealogy? How do we kind of descend from a certain group of people? So in the Taoist tradition, including classical Taoism, this could be biological and or spiritual, right? It could be either or or both. You could come from actually a Taoist family and there's evidence for that, that especially feeds into Fang Shi, uh, the formula masters lineages in the Han dynasty. So the members of the intercultivation lineage of classical Taoism had shared worldview, shared practices and shared experiences especially focusing on the Tao, on apophatic meditation, that is emptiness and stillness based meditation. And then, as I said, mystical union with the Tao that was understood primarily energetically. But there were diverse approaches and applications that we find in classical Taoism. So we might think of this as intra-Taoist debate. Some Taoists basically said you should completely disengage from the larger society and basically live in seclusion and do your own cultivation. Other Taoists wanted to have a more kind of socio-political program and apply classical Taoist views and practices to a kind of larger social program, one in which one imagined like social harmony as a possibility through Taoist principles and especially through the sage king. The primary orientation was the Tao, the way as sacred and ultimate concern. So we usually don't translate this in English anymore. Just use the romanization of the Tao. There's the Chinese character. Um, and so this relates to theology and cosmology. Theology is discourse on the sacred as a comparative category. Cosmology is the underlying principles, patterns, and structure of the universe. And so this focuses on the Tao from a Taoist perspective and especially the four primary characteristics of the Tao that I'll talk about in a moment. So when we think about this, what Taoists are really emphasizing is that there is this sacred connection that one has. We're born with it. It's original and inherent to being human, but human beings can lose it, at least apparently. So through Taoist cultivation, one can return to this original sacred connection. Um, as documented in the 4th to 2nd century BCE Zhuangzi, so another complicated text like the Tao Jing in terms of the textual and historical layers of it, but the Book of Master Zhuang. So when we think about the inner cultivation lineages, they're diverse, as I mentioned. They're loosely affiliated master disciple communities. So based on revisionist scholarship on the Zhuangzi, especially by A.C. Graham and some other later kind of intellectual heirs of him, um, we can talk about these different lineages within the Zhuangzi, and you can see their chapters associated with those lineages. These are hypothetical, right? It's not like that these Taoists actually said we're the primitivists, but these are terms that Western scholarship is using to kind of talk about the different layers of the text, the different views and the different approaches. So the primitivists, the individualists, the syncretists, the Zhuangists, and the anthologists. And I'm not gonna go through all this, but it just gives us a sense of like, there is diversity among these lineages and they're represented by different chapters in the Zhuangzi. So we can read the Zhuangzi in a radically different way as well, dividing it through this lens. So one thing that you find in classical Taoism and specifically in the Zhuangzi is this emphasis on Tao Shu, right? The techniques of the Tao. 
So the techniques of the Tao, also translated as Arts of the Way or Way Arts for short, are specifically emphasizing that their practices, Taoist practices, so they're not just Shu, they're not just techniques, they're Tao Shu, they're techniques of the Tao or Way Arts that are aimed at alignment, attunement, and realization of the Tao. So that is when we look at the inner cultivation lineages of classical Taoism in detail and look for self-referential terms, this is one of the terms, and they're really emphasizing a specific set of practices and techniques, and those techniques have very specific instructions. There's also, and this is, connects to what I said, why classical Taoism is religious and not philosophical, is that there's a soteriology. So there's a understanding what the ultimate purpose of human existence is, and also a theology of the sacred, that is a discourse on the sacred centering on the Tao. So this is, as I said, theologically infused contemplative practice. It's not just meditation, especially in a modern context is like secular or therapeutic meditation. It's not that. It's the understanding that through meditation, one orients oneself towards the Tao, one forms a deeper connection with the Tao, and this enables one to live through this sacred connection. So that's why it's theologically infused. From a classical Taoist perspective, and this is found in the Tao Te Ching in particular that we're about to look at, um, the Tao is um, the way in which the universe is understood and also the sacred, and it has these four primary characteristics. So the source of, un, of everything, an unnameable mystery, an all-pervading sacred presence, and the universe as transformed process. So this is in another Lund Tao that I did, but I'll just say a few things. So everything comes from the Tao. From a Taoist perspective, the Tao is manifesting through everything. There's a movement from primordial non-differentiation to differentiation, but it's still understood that, that, that through that process, the Tao is present in all things. So from a Taoist perspective, that means everything comes from the Tao and everything will return to the Tao. So this is Taoist source. Also, it's an unnameable mystery. So a lot of times when people first hear this, they get confused because we've called it Tao. But the Tao Te Ching says, compelled to name it, we call it Tao. Xuan mystery or darkness is an allusion to chapter one of the Tao Te Ching. So the fundamental Taoist theological view here is that the Tao as a name is just a placeholder for something beyond that name. So ultimately, it's unnameable, it's mysterious. So the Taoist response to this is cultivating a state of open re receptivity characterized by non-knowing. So this kind of openness to experiencing the Tao, especially energetically. It's an all-pervading sacred present. So here I've put Ling, it's also related to Qi. But Ling has a stronger sense of the numinous or numinosity. So some kind of sacred or divine presence. And this presence is pervading everything. So this is what I mentioned that Taoism has, and this is especially classical Taoism, but it feeds into foundational Taoist views, an energetic understanding of being and experiencing. So again, this relates to qi. Usually we don't translate it in English anymore, but you can think of it as vital breath, subtle breath, energy. Sometimes it's translated with the Greek pneuma, which kind of obscures it. Um, but in this case, what we're talking about is that there's this energetic presence infusing everything. And this can be cultivated, the ability to experience it this way. So this is also why classical Taoism tends to emphasize listening over seeing. We can listen to it in a subtle way. And then finally, the universe as transformative process or nature with a capital N. And so one thing to kind of note here is that it's a, what in technical language, a process-based ontology versus a substance-based ontology, which means the nature of existence is change. Everything's changing into something else. You've probably heard of yin and yang. So the kind of primary cosmology emphasizing this transformative process is based on yin yang interaction. That's really traditional Chinese cosmology, but then also part of traditional Taoist cosmology. One thing to note here that's really important for understanding classical Taoism, and I think Taoist practice and Taoist ways of experiencing more generally, is that it's one of the most world affirming and body affirming traditions or views. That is, the world, the universe, nature is the Tao in some respect. The Tao is manifesting through this. So this is why there's a kind of connection in the modern world between Taoism and ecology. 
because there's a sense of reverence towards the natural world, but also the human body. So the body is positive from a Taoist perspective. The Tao, the body to a certain extent is the Tao manifesting. Um, so this doesn't mean it's reducible, our selves are reducible or the Tao is reducible to the human body. It means the human body, especially understood as a psychosomatic process, is the Tao manifesting in a particular way. And this also relates to qi or energy. So in the Zhuangzi, we find these references to the Tao Shu. So it's important where it occurs. It occurs in chapter six, which is part of the inner chapters, the earliest layers of the text. So this would move it back fairly early in the formation of the emergence of what we're talking about here is classical Taoism. And then in chapter 33, which is the final chapter. And this is where you find members of classical Taoism actually articulating a kind of self-conscious sense of community and an emerging sense of tradition. So these are Taoists talking about Taoism from their perspective, even though they're not saying Taoism. So the first passage says, fish thrive in water, humans thrive in the Tao. For those who thrive in water, dig a pond and they will find nourishment enough. For those who thrive in the Tao, don't bother about them and their lives will be secure. So it is said, fish forget each other in rivers and lakes, humans forget each other through the techniques of the Tao, Tao Shu. So there are a number of interesting things about this, but for present purposes, one aspect is what I just mentioned, that this is really emphasizing a specific kind of practice, including specific techniques of the Tao that then have technical terms related to them. Um, and so I'll get into that in a moment. The analogy between fish and human beings and water and the Tao, so you might know that Tao sometimes talk about the Tao as the ocean. So just as fish, thrive in water, humans thrive in the Tao. So human beings are quasi fish. And this might, if you know the Zhuangzi more, um, invoke the joy of fish story in Zhuangzi chapter 17. But thinking about this, so it's a kind of state of flow, a state of participation in a larger field, right? And then the last part talks about forgetting Wang. So again, if you know the Zhuangzi in a deeper way, that there's this reference to Zuo Wang, sitting in forgetfulness. So inside of this, I think there's an allusion or at least a kind of connection to a very particular technique of the Tao, Zuo Wang, sitting in forgetfulness. And then the second, pass tell, second passage tells us to regard the root as pure and things as coarse, to look upon accumulation as insufficiency, dwelling alone, tranquil and placid in spiritual illumination. There were those in ancient times who held that the techniques of the Tao, Tao Shu, lay in these things. Past guardian Yin, Yin Shi and Lao Dan, Lao Tzu, heard their currents and delighted in them. They established them through constant non-being and being and mastered them through great unity. Gentle weakness and humble self-effacement are its outer marks emptiness and non-injury of the myriad beings are its substance. So there's a lot going on here. One of the first things to notice is that in the context of the Zhuangzi, these two key figures are being elevated. They're both legendary or mythological, but nonetheless, members of these lineages in, being expressed through the Zhuangzi, through the Book of Master Zhuang, are identifying them as some kind of source point. So Lao Dan and Yin Shi, as legend has it, Yin Shi was the guardian of the past who received the Tao Te Ching from Lao Tzu. And what you can see here is that it doesn't just say they come from them. They, it says there were those in ancient times, so before these figures. So this goes back to the kind of idea of the family, of the genealogy, of the ancestry. There were those who emphasized the techniques of the Tao. And then these Taoists, again, mythological Taoists, but still part of the story, heard their currents, their feng, and this is noteworthy because feng later on becomes this idea of, of Taoism. Taoism is the feng. Taoism is the wind or the currents or the movement of the Tao moving through the world in human form, or at least as a religious tradition. And then there are references to other parts of the Zhuangzi and other classical Taoist teachings. But at the end, and this relates to other um, classical Taoist texts, it talks about the outer marks and the inner substance. So when we think about Taoists, we think about individuals who practice the techniques of the Tao, they have specific qualities. So inwardly, 
they cultivate emptiness or we cultivate emptiness and non-injury, outwardly we express gentle weakness and humble self-effacement. And this would then connect to other passages in the larger classical Taoist textual corpus, but especially in the Tao Te Ching, because they could not be recognized, we feel compelled to describe them. And here's a description. So Taoists can recognize other Taoists through the qualities that they have, and specifically qualities that are cultivated through the practice of the techniques of the Tao. So if we go through the Zhuangzi with this understanding of both its emphasizing practice, its emphasizing experience, but it's also lineage based, then we start to pay attention to this, that there are different characters that show up in the Zhuangzi and oftentimes they're teachers teaching specific students. So there's an open question here of were these actual individuals, are they pseudonymous? Are they kind of fictitious, right? For the most part, that's less significant from my perspective because what the text is showing us is the way in which these Taoists were understanding the, this emerging tradition, that it really was lineage based, that it was based on teacher-student training and importantly, if you read the Zhuangzi this way, that it was dialogic, right? So the teacher is teaching the student or multiple students, and then the students are asking the teacher certain kinds of questions, getting clarification. But sometimes it's also students talking to other students about what they've learned. Sometimes a master or a teacher teaches someone, and then they show up later now as a teacher, and they're teaching something, and they're recalling that early, those earlier teachings. So it's quite complicated if you really read the Zhuangzi in this kind of more radical revisionist way. So the classical Taoist textual corpus is fairly large. This is based upon the revisionist scholarship of Harold Roth at Brown University. Um, I've worked on it as well, but he's really done the most systematic kind of analysis of the text of this textual corpus. So I'm not going to go through all of this. Um, you can kind of think about what text would be included, especially from this revisionist perspective. But also, if and this some of this is in the Tao Te Ching book, if you look at this in detail, there are a lot of texts that have been lost. There are also some archaeological materials that have been found. So it's more complicated than this. This is more of like a kind of analysis of a set of received texts that have been categorized in certain ways, oftentimes not as Taoist. But then when you analyze them in a deeper way, you find that they're Taoist views, they're Taoist practices, there's a kind of Taoist approach in them. So for our purposes, what we're focusing on for this Lundao is the Laozi, um, Book of Venerable Masters, more conventionally translates the Book of Master Lao, but as we'll talk about in a moment, Louds is not a personal name, so I think it's better to understand this as plural, the Book of Venerable Masters, in a way that parallels the Huainanza, the Book of the Huainan Masters, right? So when you read this in classical Chinese, it's unclear if the zi is singular or plural. Sometimes it's quite clearly singular, like the Zhuangzi, the Book of Master Zhuang, but here it could just as well be plural, which I think it is. Um, it's also referred to honorifically, and so this is the, the title that's used most frequently, especially among Taoists and in the modern world, the Tao Te Ching, so spelled with a T and a CH in the earlier Wei Zhao's uh, romanization, but still pronounced Tao Te Ching, the scripture on the Tao and inner power. So it's also translated as the classic on the way in virtue, but I think this is a way to avoid its sacred standing in Taoism. So thus scripture, a sacred text from a Taoist perspective. So this is the new book that just came out through Square Inch Press, Tao Te Ching, a contextual, contemplative, and annotated translation. Um, one thing to be thinking about is the material culture aspect. So how is the Tao Te Ching being presented as a material artifact? If it is, a lot of times now it's eBooks. So is that really the Tao Te Ching, right? Because it's not actually a text anymore. It's like a digital edition. So then also, what is the material culture and the visual culture being represented? So in this case, the cover design, the cover image was chosen intentionally by me. This is true of most of my books. So it's a detail of an Eastern Han dynasty, so 25 to 220 CE tomb mural. And the two figures in the foreground, that is the lower kind of segment of it, are playing Liu Bo, the Six Sticks game, which is an ancient Chinese board game. And this is roughly contemporaneous with the most influential editions of the Tao Te Ching. So 
from my perspective, um, there's a number of reasons to choose this image versus some other more conventional representations that are used. So there are a few things I'll say. The first is you note that there are three panels and that's mirroring the subtitle. So a contextual, contemplative, and annotated bilingual translation. That is, we're trying to locate the Tao Jing in the early, or sorry, the late warring states and early Western Han Dynasty. We're thinking about the contemplative layers of it. And then we also have this scholarly approach that's thinking about it historically, but also hermeneutically, like how would we interpret it in a more sophisticated bilingual manner? So those three panels are mirroring those three approaches. We might say, you know, contextual, right, contemplative and scholarly. There's also a literary dimension of this. Um, and then you see that it's actually interactive. So there are people engaging in certain kinds of activities. It's dialogic. They consist, each one consists of two people, although the lower one has an attendant, a female attendant as well. And then the lower one, they're playing this board game. So we might think about the way in which the Dao Jing is participating in a larger kind of game. So what game is being played? What are the rules of the game and so on? And so in this case, what I wanna say is how do we actually locate ourselves in the dialogic exchange that's being expressed through the Dao Jing? Participate in that, be informed by that. Um, this stands in contrast to most other uh, translations of the Dao Jing and studies of the Dao Jing. And when you look at the, the covers of these books, they express something, they communicate something. A lot of them have images of Lao Tzu on the cover. Well, we know Lao Tzu is mythological or legendary. So why put Lao Tzu on the cover when, and of course this is a revisionist view, but the Lao Tzu, the title of the earliest title of the text is actually the Book of Venerable Masters. So it obscures what the text actually is, thinking that it's associated with this myth mythological figure, like as the actual author of the text. Another example that you find is calligraphy, which is fine, but are you really engaging the Dao Jing as a calligraphic rendering? Whose calligraphy is it? Is it calligraphy rate related to the Dao Jing? You know, so one thing related to this is you find the Guo Dian bamboo slips, which have a certain kind of calligraphy on them. And that's closer, right? But is that really what the Dao Jing is? So if you're translating the Guo Dian manuscripts, you're translating a very particular kind of manuscript from a very particular historical period. And the relationship of that to the received Dao Jing is extremely complex. And I go through this in the book. And a lot of the time what you find is abstract Chinese paintings, landscape paintings, or even modern abstract, like kind of nature photographs. None of this has anything to do with Taoism. I mean, with sorry, with, with uh, Dao Te Ching. The Dao Te Ching is not talking about nature in an abstract sense, right? So why choose that? And I think one of the reasons to choose that is to kind of gloss over the actual contextual meaning of the Dao Te Ching, but also make it seem like it's universal, like it's really about just being in nature, when in fact the Dao Te Ching is much more about a specific contemplative practice, being located in community, having a certain kind of training that's instructional and so on. So thinking about the way in which this is being represented through visual culture. So this is a truly new translation. Most of the translations that have been published recently, including forthcoming ones, are actually old translations. They just repeat the exact same kind of translation methodology. They largely parallel other translations. They're rooted in a certain kind of construction and I think appropriation and domestication of the text. So what does it mean to say we're trying to make a new translation? And this goes back to what I said earlier, contextual, contemplative, and annotated, including a literary and scholarly sensibility. So contextual, attentiveness to socio-historical and religio-cultural influences and situatedness, specifically the late Warring States period, so around 300 BCE to the early Western Han Dynasty, right, around 150 BCE religion. So this is something that's unique, right? It's not just saying it, there's a kind of cultural moment in Chinese history here, but what was going on religiously? And of course, this is coming out of my own training in religious studies, but I think this is really essential for understanding the Dao Te Ching in particular and classical Taoism more generally. So specifically the intercultivation lineages of classical Taoism, locating the text there, 
thinking about this as loosely affiliated master disciple communities, emphasizing spiritual discipline oriented toward the Tao as source. And when you read the Tao Te Ching this way, what you find is there's actually dialogic exchange within the text. There's a strong emphasis on a certain kind of training, a certain approach, and so on. Contemplative. Um, so an exploration of the central importance of consistent and prolonged apophatic and quietistic meditation, that is emptiness and stillness based meditation. This meditation is primarily contentless, non-conceptual and non-dualistic. It emphasizes attunement and union, specifically the view of innate nature as stillness, as the Tao as stillness, you know, you know lowercase s and uppercase s. So the stillness within is connected to the larger stillness without, and that stillness is the field of being, that is the Tao as this energetic field. And then bringing a contemplative approach and mode to reading and applying the text itself. So the contemplative is not just informing the translation, the contemplative is not just reading the text in a contemplative way that is attentive to the contemplative dimensions of the text. It's also saying maybe something that I refer to in the book as a Taoist contemplative hermeneutics is possible. So how we read the text contemplatively, how we interpret the text contemplatively, and from my perspective, this would include um, applying certain principles from the text itself. It's also annotated, so there's extensive interpretive notes, there are paragraph and chapter summaries for each chapter, there are cross-references, so this functions like a kind of quasi-concordance, and then discussion of technical terminology and contemplative dimensions. There are also references to important manuscripts and major redactions, including important character variants. So just from this alone, you can see we're going much deeper into the text. We're thinking about the Tao Te Ching as a classical Taoist text, but also as a Taoist scripture, a Taoist sacred text, raising questions about how is it located in the Taoist tradition? How have Taoists read and interpreted the text? But then also, how do we do this in English? Is it possible to have a bilingual sensibility or a bilingual approach, even if one doesn't know classical Chinese? So this relates also to received and inaccurate views of the Tao Te Ching versus revisionist and informed views. There's, I have an online crib sheet, the Tao Te Ching crib sheet that actually parallels this and has even more content. So first, there's a received and inaccurate view of the Tao Te Ching as written by a single author. This goes back to the first slide talking about um, the depictions of Lao Tzu and the presentations of the Tao Te Ching as somehow written by Lao Tzu. So most of the, um, the translations in what I refer to as the Tao Te Ching translation industry have the title Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching. And then when you look at who the author is, it's Lao Tzu. And so it's this kind of complete um, confusion not necessarily about the traditional attribution, but the historical facts of the text. So that it was written by a single author, the revisionist informed view is that the Tao Te Ching is a multivocal anthology consisting of historical and textual material from at least the fourth to the second century BCE. So very complicated as a text, as a received text in terms of what you're reading and where it comes from. The Lao Tzu as the author of the Tao Te Ching, in fact, Lao Tzu is pseudo-historical, even mythological. The Tao Te Ching contains the teachings and practices of various anonymous elders of the inner cultivation lineage of the classical Taoism. They compiled, edited, preserved, and transmitted these teachings by later descendants, so there's a lineage. So one of the arguments for lineage and one, some of the evidence for lineage is the text itself. The fact that the text was compiled, the fact that the text was actually preserved and transmitted and through the Taoist tradition. OK, so we want to be thinking about how this text came to be. Um, a received and accurate view is that the Tao Te Ching is philosophy. And I mentioned this, how philosophy is constructed is usually through conventional lines. The revisionist informed view is it's more about contemplation and mysticism. So a particular kind of approach, a specific set of practices focusing, as I said, on apophatic meditation, and then mysticism. So mysticism here is used in a comparative sense as it's kind of understood in religious studies as direct experiences of the sacred. So this is somewhat complicated, right? Because how do we know that people had direct experiences of the sacred? 
So in a more nuanced way, we'd say direct experience of the sacred as an individual or given community understands the sacred. And in this case, what we're talking about is Taoists. So what is Taoist mysticism, direct experiences of the Tao, and then there's a spectrum of those kinds of experiences. That the received and inaccurate view says that the Tao Te Ching is a rational and paradoxical. Um, in fact, it's about a kind of transpersonal and perspectival way of understanding reality and also of reading the text. So this is manifesting through the text, but it might also inform the way that we engage the text. That the Tao Te Ching is primarily about disembodied ideas and thoughts, so this goes to the way that philosophy is constructed, but in fact it's primarily about practice and experience. The views are rooted in apophatic meditation and in contemplative and mystical experience, so this is all mapped out in the Tao Te Ching book. But one thing to be thinking about here is, um, can you really understand this text? without engaging in apophatic meditation. That is, is it going to lead to all kinds of confusion if you don't understand the way in which those views are rooted in the practice and maybe the practice is required? And then that it's a spiritual classic and wisdom literature, sometimes even talked about in this absurd way as a Tao book, but in fact, it's a classical Taoist text and Taoist scripture that is a Taoist sacred text. So thinking about Lao Tzu, the Lao Tzu, the earliest title of the received Tao Te Ching. This literally means old master. It's not a name. Lao is not a surname. As we said with, saw with Lao Dan, Dan is the surname. Lao is the honorific address. So Lao as old or venerable. So in this case, it's the old master. But as I've said to you, I think it's actually the old masters. It's plural. It's not designating a person. The text was originally untitled. The earliest title, possibly in the third century BCE, was the Lao Tzu, the Book of Venerable Masters. So the text as multivocal and plural, you can compare this to the Book of Master Lao, which is univocal and singular. Um, but when you look at this historically, the legend of Lao Tzu actually postdates the text. So it looks like the text as the Lao Tzu, as the Book of Venerable Masters, the idea that it was a compilation of teachings of various people, um, is before the appearance of this character that then becomes the attributed author of the text. And the reason why that's the case, the reason why Taoist in particular starts to start to advance a character named Lao Tzu associated with the Lao Tzu um, is multi-layered and it comes from different periods and there's a kind of unfolding of the legend. So this work really was done by AC Graham in a very sophisticated kind of systematic way, but I summarize it in the Tao Te Ching book. So the Du De Jing, you can see the subtitle, a Dudist interpretation of the Tao Te Ching. So this of course is absurd. It's a popular publication, but it's interesting, right? Because it's closer to the historical facts not in terms of its content, but in terms of the way that it's presenting the Tao Te Ching. So it presents the Tao Te Ching as a combination of the teachings of Lao Tzu. So again, we know that's mythological, but we can just say Lao Tzu as the placeholder for the Tao Te Ching and Jeffrey Lebowski, the dude from the Big Lebowski. Um, and this relates to Dudism or the Church of the Latter-day Dudes, right? So this kind of popular um, kind of religion, right? So it's it's paradoxical, right? It's satirical. It's intended to kind of poke fun at all of these things. So the Church of the Latter-day Dudes is obviously a kind of play on the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, so the so-called Mormons. And thinking about then the way in which you can combine different teachings. So as I said, it's absurd, but it's self-consciously absurd, unlike most popular engagements and appropriations of Taoism. It's pointing to a kind of popular engagement with it that's saying, I'm combining all these different um, views and all these different values into something that's my own. And one of those things is the Tao Te Ching, at least the Tao Te Ching as engaged through certain kinds of Western approximations of it. So as I said, I would say this is actually closer to the historical facts of the Tao Te Ching as, as multivocal, albeit in terms of a different lineage. So then thinking about the honorific title of the Lao Tzu, the Book of Venerable Masters, the Tao Te Ching, 
right? So Jing here, I translate as scripture in the sense of sacred text. It's also translated as classic, but from a Taoist perspective and in the larger Taoist tradition, it's a Jing, it's a scripture, and this is the most important genre of Taoist literature. So these are generally thought to be revealed and or inspired. They have a closer connection with the Tao. They're, the Tao and the Taoist tradition is somehow moving through them to a certain extent. And then Tao and De, so we've been talking about the Tao as a sacred and ultimate concern of Taoist, that there are particular Taoist cosmological and theological views of the Tao. But the but de inner power, or sometimes translate with the Latin virtue via the Latin virtue, um, in the sense of one's overall character, one's conduct. And so here, from my perspective, I prefer to translate de as inner power. It's the Tao manifesting through human beings as embodied activity in the world. Okay? And this is the order. So the order is that the Tao is primary, the Tao is the sacred, and there's a way to cultivate this connection with the Tao and have it manifest, excuse me, through us. And that is a kind of energetic and numinous transmission. If we then take some of these pieces and put them together, I talk about stages of composition and redaction. So moving from oral traditions, including mnemonic aphorisms, so that's earlier than the earliest you know, received um, approximation of the text. So we can say maybe as early as around the fifth century, so the 400s BCE to the fourth century BCE, so the 300s, then collections of sayings around the fourth century BCE. So maybe, you know, 350, maybe even earlier, at least for some of those layers of the text, but then early anthologies, so around 300 BCE. So the reason to date it here is this is the date of the Guodian bamboo slips. Okay? And so that's the earliest um, archeological materials and manuscript that we have. So the earliest version, it's not titled the Lao Tzu, it's not titled the Tao Te Ching. So there's this kind of question of what is the relationship? And the relationship is, is that it feeds into the emergence of a text that becomes titled the Lao Tzu. Then moving into classified, sorry, codified, classified, and edited anthologies around 200 BCE. So this is about the time of the Mawang Dui manuscripts, the so-called Silk Lao Tzu. And then we have a kind of more complete text. But what's interesting when you really go into the various manuscripts and uh, discovered materials and so on, is that it doesn't stay a complete text. So even some of the later materials and contemporaneous materials aren't a complete text. So it's quite complicated in thinking about the unfolding of the composition and redaction. And then finally, we have fully integrated and standardized editions. So you can see this is quite late, around the second to the third century CE, with the Wang Bi redaction and the Hushang Gong redaction being kind of the most influential ones. So when we talk about the standard received edition, this is the text that's translated with emendations in my book. It's really the Wang Bi edition, but the Wang Bi edition, as you'll see in a moment, is probably derived from the Hushang Gong edition as received, so not originally. Okay. So now we have a kind of historical problem, which is the text of the editions that people are tending to consult and translate are actually coming from a much later historical period. So we have this question about the relationship of five, for example, to four, you know, some kind of three or 400 years later, um, how is it kind of connected to uh, a, an edition or a text like the Ma Wang Dui text? So this is my tentative and hypothetical textual affiliations of extant manuscripts and early editions. You can see it's very technical, it's very specialized. Um, it could be less, complex than this, right? So depending on how one analyzes all the materials, things might be compressed more. But in fact, when you start adding all the different additions of all the different redactions, it becomes even more complicated. But for this, what I just want to show you is, from my perspective, we have oral traditions that feed into Guodian. And what happens from Guodian forward is difficult to determine, because obviously, those are manuscripts that were um, placed in a tomb. So what, were there other copies of that that circulated, for example, and then fed into some of these other texts? Hypothetical anthologies, right? Feeding into a kind of or text. So you see an or text means the kind of original or source text. And I have this in plural. 
So was there really an ur text? We don't know. I don't think so. I think there were multiple texts, multiple kinds of compilations or anthologies, and those fed into the Han fades and the Huainanza. And then you can kind of see it keeps going. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But what I want you to see is that then there's this movement into the RT. So the RT, if you look at the legend, is the standard received text. We don't know what manuscript or what manuscript tradition actually was the basis of the standard received text, but that feeds into these, what I mentioned to you, the coming out of um, basically the second to the third century CE. So the Wang Bi edition, the He Gong edition, the Shang R edition, and you can see then um, from what we can tell based on um, Wagner's um, trilogy of works, the Wang Bi redaction was actually lost and the Hushang Gong redaction was put into the received Wang Bi um, commentary. So then we move from the Hushang Gong edition to the Wang Bi edition that feeds into the RT to the standard received text as we as I'm translating, but also as we tend to read it in the modern world. So I know this is quite technical, maybe a little difficult to follow, but one thing that comes up here is that when we think about the standard received text, it's a very particular edition of the text. We have a question about which editions are people reading and translating, but also when we talk about the standard received edition or the standard received text, we really have to talk about it as the Hushang Gong Wang Bi edition. Okay, um, even though it tends to be referred to as the Wang Bi edition, it has this connection to the Hushang Gong commentary the Elder Dwelling by the River commentary, which is one of the most influential Taoist commentaries. Okay, so I'm gonna um, switch screens, show you something else. Sorry, just give me a minute. Okay, so there's a number of reasons to show this to you. Um, I'm just going to switch back to the So thinking about calligraphic renderings of the Tao Te Ching. So traditionally, how was it written? How was it read? Um, and traditional Chinese text, traditional Taoist literature were written from top to bottom, right to left. 
So we're reading things vertically. We're not reading things horizontally. So you have this question about the format of it, the layout of it, the kind of reading experience, but also you can see here the material culture of it, this highly refined kind of calligraphy. What is it like to engage the data gene this way rather than the kind of received way that is a lot of times in a kind of Western uh, formatting and so on, maybe even not as texts, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so this is an example of the lineation that's used in my book. Um, it's partially indebted to my work with Harold Roth of Brown University in the Data Jing seminar, which was held from 2017 to 2019, and which I co uh, sorry, which I co-organized and co-facilitated. So there are a number of distinctive features of this that you can see that right just looking at the Data Jing this way in Chinese, and of course. This would be on facing pages. So the Chinese on the left in my book, the English on the right, which isn't here. So when you look at this, you're looking at a radically different kind of organization of the text. So there are a few things. I mean, one about the book, it's obviously bilingual. So I'm asking readers to kind of think about the relationship of the original Chinese Taoist classical text, classical Chinese text, to the English approximation, to the English translation. It's not lineated, the lines are numbered, right? So this is different from other even lineated texts where it's like it allows you to actually compare lines more easily. And then the actual lineation, okay? So the actual lineation is um, left margin justified for prose, single indent or single tab for parallel prose, and double indent or double tab for aphorisms, poetry, and sayings. So this is showing us the layers of the text, different formatting within the text, but I would suggest even different kinds of historical and textual layers, right? Potentially coming from different periods. And you see this a lot in the text where some of it is actually commentaries. A lot of it doesn't go together. So it's quite clearly like an editor put these things together. And a lot of this is discussed in the book, so I'm not gonna go through it all. But you also see these weird um, symbols, right? At the end of the lines. And these are um, a symbol system that I developed that's a kind of quasi scansion system to show you the rhymes, the rhyming of the lines. This is different than so called Mandarin, right? Modern, the standard modern Chinese pronunciations. Although some people will talk about, oh, this line rhymes with this, they're using modern Mandarin pronunciations that don't parallel what is here, which is actually referred to as archaic or old Chinese. So there are phonetic reconstructions of Chinese characters. And when we analyze that, um, we find that there are specific rhyme patterns in the Tao Jing and also other texts as well. So one of the reasons to use these symbols rather than the phonetic reconstructions is that they use the international phonetic alphabet, which basically for people who don't know how to pronounce it, looks like a symbol system anyway. Um, so this is just to give you a sense of all the different layers of the text, layers of the text inside of a given chapter, and then the ability to kind of compare the Chinese to the English and also think about the organization of it. So from my perspective, which you saw on the previous slide, the double indent or the double tab, the aphorisms, the poetry, the sayings, are the earliest layer of the text. So we can think of this as mnemonic aphorisms, that is, they were meant to be memorized. They kind of standardize or codify teachings, I would say oral teachings of earlier Taoist teachers and members, as I said, these anonymous members of the inner cultivation lineages of classical Taoism. So these are just some examples. Um, empty the heart mind and fill the belly weaken the will and strengthen the bone. So that's chapter three. Blunt the sharpness, untie the knots, harmonize the brightness, unite with the dust. So chapter four, this also appears in chapter 56. And appear plain and embrace simplicity, lessen selfishness and decrease desire. So if you're thinking through what I'm presenting to you here, these are contemplative sayings. These are contemplative principles. You can also engage them as Taoists have often done as actually providing technical instructions on how to do the practice. So for example, empty the heart mind and fill the belly. 
There are different ways of reading this, of course, in context. So that's the contextual element of the book. But the contemplative element of the book is, yes, okay, what are the different contextual readings, but then how is it read from a kind of lived practice-based perspective? And in this case, Taoists oftentimes read this as instructions on apophatic meditation. So you want to practice emptiness and stillness-based meditation, empty the heart mind and fill the belly. So release the tension, release the psychological agitation, the habituated emotional and intellectual upheaval of the heart, and let that weight, let that kind of energy sink down through the body to fill the belly. So here it says fu. So the belly can mean the navel region, the lower abdomen. In Japanese, it's the hara. But in the later Taoist tradition, this is understood as the lower dantian, the lower elixir field. So the primary storehouse of qi in the body. So there is a kind of assumed practice here that would be unpacked, I think, even in its context orally. So the teacher might give you this and say, these are the aphorisms. These are the sayings that we want you to memorize. And then this is what they mean. So when you're doing the practice or living your life, you can use them to remind yourself of how to do it. So in doing this radical rereading of the Tao Te Ching, one thing I would suggest is having a more sophisticated or a deeper understanding of praxis. And this is my kind of theory of praxis. It's in my books, um, Contemplative Literature and Introducing Contemplative Studies. So it's not just practice in a general sense. It's definitely not practice reduced to techniques. Praxis I'm using in a technical sense as views, practices or methods, experiences, and goals. So that is, these are interrelated, right? Many people in the modern world are extracting Taoist techniques out of the Taoist tradition, out of a larger kind of Taoist practice, but especially without an informing Taoist view. So here, what we're looking at is the interrelationship of these, how they're mutually informing. So we're doing in the context of classical Taoism, a particular kind of practice, apophatic meditation, that has a particular Taoist view informing it. And I've already mentioned this, that the stillness of innate nature is the stillness of the Tao. So it's beyond a kind of subject object dichotomy or dualism. That will lead to a specific kind of experience. So the experience of the Tao as this numinous, mysterious presence, right? And then the goal, what is the goal? Mystical union with the Tao. So each of these is informing the other, right? If you have this experience of disappearing into the Tao and being energetically infused with the Tao's sacred presence, this, cons this conform sorry, confirms the Taoist view of the Tao as this unnameable mystery, as this all-pervading sacred presence. And then it also confirms the efficacy of the practice and so on. So this is kind of how this works. So we can bring this interpretive framework, it's informed by comparative and cross-cultural religious studies into understanding the data chain. So this is one of the maps that I created. All right, so the kind of um, key practices in the data gene, you can see it's alphabetical. It has all the chapters where these terms appear. It's emphasizing specific technical terms related to classical Taoist uh, practice, as I understand it. And you can see it's quite complex. So one of the reasons to do this is to give you more access to the deeper contemplative layers of the text, the practice based nature of the text. Um, a map of how to explore these aspects of the text, but also to kind of challenge conventional readings of it. So if you think the text is philosophy, then explain this, right? And explain how this really is the language of contemplative practice. It's not the language of kind of philosophical rumination. rumination. It's really giving you principles and instructions about how to lead a Taoist life rooted in Taoist practice. And so you can see, especially towards the bottom, Shou Jing, cultivating stillness, Shou Zhong, cultivating the center, Shou Tse, guard, uh, sorry, guarding stillness, guarding the center, guarding the feminine. And so this relates to a really, probably the most well-known classical Taoist term for apophatic meditation, Shou Yi, um, guarding the one or guarding oneness. And so here, show is a technical term related to classical Taoist meditation that feeds into the larger Taoist tradition and so on. So show as this classical Taoist technical term 
is a designation for meditation. And I just showed you Shotsa, so that we're reading this left to right, top to bottom, Shotsa guarding the feminine, Shojin guarding stillness, Shojong guarding the center, and Shoyi guarding the one. So these are terms for apophatic and quietistic meditation, that is emptiness and stillness based meditation in the Tao Te Ching. The etymology is interesting. So those of you who know my work, I'm really interested in the ways that Taoists have read and applied and interpreted Chinese characters. So the top part is Mian roof and the bottom part is Sun. It literally means like hand, specifically the radial pulse on the wrist. So that is the pictogram or the ideogram. And then what we get is it gets used for inch. So especially like for instance, in classical Chinese medicine as a kind of measurement. Here, it's interesting because it's pointing, first of all, to guarding. So underneath the roof, guarding something, this is what we're doing in meditation. And then if you know the Tao Te Ching, it talks about things like jade and treasures and so on. So our body is a storehouse and we're guarding certain kinds of contemplative states, contemplative traditions, this alignment with the Tao. But what's interesting is in the later Taoist tradition, this sun also becomes used in the phrase Fang Sun, square inch, the name of square inch press. And this is the inspiration behind the name of the press. And so Fang Sun square inch is usually understood as a mystical space or non-space within the heart. So when we look at it this way, when we practice show, whatever kind of guarding we're practicing, there's a focus on the heart as a kind of empty center, as an empty field, and the chi sinking down from that place into the lower abdomen, into the navel region as the primary storehouse of chi in the body. Um, show Yi guarding the one is not in the Tao Te Ching, it's in the Neya, it's in inward training, it's also in the Zhuangs of the Book of Master Zhuang. So there's a very complex history to this term. Um, but as I said, it's the most well-known term, but you do find the parallel Bao Yi embracing the one in the Tao Te Ching, and then Zhi Yi maintaining or grasping the one also in the Neya. So all of these are technical terms related to classical Taoist uh, meditation. And then we have the associated experiences, qualities, and modes of being in the Tao Te Ching. So this is another mapping of the text. You can see all the different chapters where these terms appear, what's being emphasized. And again, one of the reasons to do this is to show that it's not just contemplative practice now. There are references to contemplative experience, although those tend to be somewhat general or abstract or vague because of the nature of the Tao Te Ching, they're there. And we can also use other classical Taoist texts to kind of unpack this, to fill in the details. And I do this a lot in the interpretive notes in the Tao Te Ching book. Um, but then to think about the relationship between contemplative practice and contemplative experience, like I showed you in that kind of praxis uh, slide. So when we then look at the Tao Te Ching through this interpretive framework, we find a kind of discussion of apophatic meditation. So this is one of the most important chapters from my perspective. It's chapter 16. It's part of what I refer to as the seven core contemplative chapters. And chapter 16 tells us, extend emptiness completely, guard stillness. So this is the Shou Jing, guard stillness steadfastly. The myriad beings arise together. I simply observe their return. All beings flourish and multiply. Each again returns to the root. Returning to the root, Gui Gun, is called stillness, Jing. This means returning to life destiny, Fu Ming. Returning to life destiny is called constancy, Chang. Knowing constancy is called illumination, Ming. So again, there are a lot of layers to this, but this is to show you that if you read the Tao Te Ching carefully, there are a number of passages that really are describing the process and maybe even providing instructions on classical Taoist apophatic meditation. So here, focusing on emptiness, Xu, and stillness, Jing. And then what does the Tao Te Ching tell us? You want to return to the root. So the root here is connected to Ming, life destiny. But from my perspective, Ming is also used somewhat in a somewhat parallel way as Xing, innate nature. So our original and inherent connection with the Tao is the root. And the fundamental root is the Tao. So we might capitalize the R and say the root, sometimes translated as source, but that's usually UN. So returning to the root is stillness. 
Stillness gives us the ability to return to life destiny. That is our connection with the Tao, but also in a way, the way in which the Tao manifests through us as a sense of life purpose, as a sense of vocation. And this leads to constancy and illumination. So there's a very clear kind of contemplative formula here and in other chapters of the Tao Te Ching. When we connect this to the larger classical Taoist textual corpus, the two most probably important technical discussions of this kind of meditation are Zhuangzi chapter six and sorry, Zhuangzi chapter four and Zhuangzi chapter six um, that are connected. So if you read this in context, you can see it's a dialogue, it's unfolding, it starts in chapter four and then it picks back up in chapter six. So there's some interesting ways of reading this that I talk about in um, another Lundao. But the first chapter, the first passage on Xinjai, the fasting of the heart mind says, you must fast. I will tell you what that means. Do you think that it is easy to do anything while you have a heart mind? If you do, the luminous heavens will not support you. Unify your aspirations. Don't listen with your ears, listen with your heart mind. No, don't listen with your heart mind, listen with chi. Listening stops with the ears, the heart mind stops with joining, but she is empty and waits on all things. The Tao gathers in emptiness alone. Emptiness, shu, is the fasting of the heart mind, Xinjai. And sorry, the diacritics are missing there, the tone mark. So both are first tones, so Xinjai. So if we think through this as actually giving us instructions, it's talking about concentrating our aspirations. So what are we trying to do in meditation? We're bringing our aspirations into oneness, into the state of unification. And we're disengaging sense perception. So we're not letting the ears listen to the outside world. We're bringing that awareness into the heart mind, but not just into the heart mind, into chi, the chi of the body, the kind of vital breath or the subtle breath, the energy of the body. And then specifically, if we connect it to some of the other passages into the navel region. So listening to chi sinking and storing into the navel region, but also the movement of chi through the body and in the larger world. And so realizing the limitations, the limitations of the ears in terms of sense perception, the, the limitations of the heart mind, at least in terms of its habituated and ordinary state of psychological upheaval, that it's engaging the world, that it's uniting with the world, that it's thinking about things, but she is empty and waits on all things. And so this is rare, right, in classical Taoism, that you have a definition. Xin Jai, the fasting of the heart mind, withholding ordinary kind of engagements of the heart mind, of kind of cognitive activity, is Shu is emptiness. So the extent to which we're in a state of emptiness is the extent to which we're practicing heart fasting, Xin Jai. And then it continues on in chapter six. So this is an unfolding, and I would say it's actually a deepening of the practice and more technical instructions. So it continues on and says, I'm improving. I can sit and forget. I smash up my limbs and body, drive out perception and intellect, cast off form, do away with understanding and make myself identical with great pervasion, da ton. This is what I mean by sitting in forgetfulness, so long. So again, disengaging sense perception, disengaging form, not being attached to form, including one's own form, doing away with understanding, so not being in, a, in this process of analysis and discernment, but really merging into the Tao. So this is that state of mystical union, of mystical pervasion, here referred to as Da Tong, could also understand it as major connection. Um, and then it says, this is what I mean by Zuo Wang, sitting in forgetfulness. So again, there's a definition here. Zuo Wang is great pervasion, Da Tong. So the extent to which we've disappeared from ordinary human personhood, dissolved this sense of separate identity or subject-object dichotomies, is the extent to which we've gone into the state of Wang, of forgetfulness. Zuo Wang sometimes is mistranslated as sitting in oblivion. This is inaccurate. One of the reasons that's problematic to translate Wang as oblivion is that it doesn't show you the parallel, right? Xu as emptiness, Jing as stillness, Wang as forgetfulness are parallel contemplative states. So hopefully you can hear that. Right, emptiness, stillness, forgetfulness, right? Xu, Jing, and Wang as kind of parallel. 
So we also find this reference to do alone or aloneness. In my way of analyzing the Tao Te Ching and the larger classical Taoist textual corpus, this is a technical term related to solitary contemplative practice and especially kind of this emptiness-based, stillness-based form of meditation. So it's aloneness in the sense of being alone, solitary and silent meditation, but also contemplative seclusion and interiority. So there's a way to understand this as one goes into the deepest state of aloneness, that's innate nature. And that connects us to the Tao as the alone, right? With an uppercase A. So again, a kind of model of mystical pervasion of mystical union, or just of the state of unity beyond even the process of uniting. So we have these do passages um, in the Tao Te Ching chapter 20. It says, ordinary people are all excited as though celebrating the Tai Lao festival, as though ascending a tower in spring. I alone do am tranquil, showing no sign. I resemble an infant who has not yet become a child. So aloneness is connected to tranquility, uh, uh, connected to disappearance. Disappearance is almost analogous, right, to an infant in the womb. So being connected to the mother, the Tao as mother, so in this kind of embryonic state, or maybe even the kind of early state of differentiation, but still being connected to the mother. So the Tao Jing talks about this, being fed by the mother, being nourished by the Tao, still having that original connection, but not yet differentiated in the state of being a child. So this is complicated in the Tao Jing, the relationship between infancy and childhood, the way that child is used in classical Taoism. But here what we're finding is that there really is this sense of do as being alone in a unified state. And then when we move into the Zhuangzi chapter six, which is really important because this is um, the passage where new you, woman you is teaching. So a senior female Taoist elder, we'll talk about that more in a moment. This is also something that Kate and I are working on, Kate Townsend and I are working on in thinking about the kind of history of female participation in Taoism, maybe in a way that other people haven't noticed before. So woman Yu says to her disciple, she's describing teaching another disciple, training another disciple, and she says, I began explaining and kept at him, show, so the same show that we saw earlier, guarding him for three days. And after that, he was able to put the world outside of himself. When he had put the world outside himself, I kept at him for seven more days. And after that, he was able to put things outside himself. When he had put things outside of himself, I kept at him for nine more days. And after that, he was able to put life outside of himself. After he had put life outside himself, he was able to achieve the brightness of dawn. And when he achieved the brightness of dawn, he could see his own aloneness. After he had managed to see his own aloneness, he could do away with past and present. And after he had done away with past and present, he was able to enter where there is no life and no death. So we can see that there's this kind of contemplative process and the contemplative process says, right, putting the world outside oneself, then putting things outside oneself, right? Then putting life out once outside oneself. So we refer to this as the Sanwai, the three externalizations. And then it moves into deeper contemplative states, moments in the contemplative process where eventually one gets to aloneness, but there's, there are things even beyond that. So doing away with past and present or overcoming past and present. So going into a state of timelessness and also beyond life and death. And we'll see that in a moment. So what you find in classical Taoism also is an emphasis on posture and psychosomatic cultivation. So in Neye Inward Training, chapter 11, it says, when your body is not aligned, inner power will not arrive. When the center lacks stillness, the heart mind will not be governed. Align your body and assist inner power, then the Tao will gradually arrive on its own. And so there's a way of kind of understanding this as the relationship between body and mind in a conventional sense. Okay, so you have your kind of physicality and your physicality is directly connected to your consciousness. Your consciousness is being influenced by your physicality and vice versa. But here we have to add that this is really a Taoist energetic view. So it's only psychosomatic in a conventional sense, mind, body. It's actually all energetic. So these are connected by having like a kind of structure, a sound structure, 
there's an energetic integrity of the body that allows the mind to kind of relax and open and so on. So we don't know the specifics of the posture as it's being described in the classical Taoist text, but we, if we look at contemporaneous archeological materials, so this is a Western Han Dynasty Su Zither player, so not the Qin Zither, but the Su Zither, so a particular ancient Chinese instrument that you can look up if you're interested. It's roughly contemporaneous with the later layers of the Tao Te Ching. And what we can see from this, and this is not just this particular artifact, but many examples from this period, is that the standard way of sitting was on the heels. Um, there probably, you probably weren't sitting on benches. There might have been mats in certain contexts, so the Zhuangzi seems to support this, but definitely sitting on the heels. So this is referred to as Zhuangzi in Chinese, aligned sitting or the standard sitting in Japanese is pronounced Seiza. So you might associate this posture with Seiza, but it actually looks like the earliest kind of classical Taoist posture used in meditation. And so this is also kind of indebted to Harold Roth's revision of scholarship, but thinking about the four alignments, he talks about as the fourfold aligning, aligning the body, aligning the four limbs, aligning the chi, aligning the heart mind. And so I've also worked on this and kind of developed it in certain ways, but then going through this process, right, of actually having structural alignment, um, making sure the limbs are aligned as well. So that's one way of increasing that kind of structural integrity. And then what's interesting in the Naya is it's prioritizing chi, um, right, as the next step and then moving into the heart mind, but the heart mind is the deepest. So this challenges, there's, you can see there's a kind of intra-Daoist debate or at least intra-Daoist diversity about how this is being explained. The Zhuangzi definitely puts the primary emphasis on qi and the Zhuang, and sorry, the Dao Te Ching is also kind of talking about emptying the heart mind and filling the belly connected maybe to qi as well. So here what we're seeing, I think in the case of the Neya is because it's um, part of the Xin Shu, the techniques of the heart mind chapters, the Guanzi, is it talks about there's an inner heart mind. There's a heart mind within the heart mind. So beyond the ordinary heart mind in its kind of state of psychological upheaval, there's the original heart mind, if you will, the original inherent connection to the Tao. So this kind of state of pure consciousness. So that then connects to Qi, right? Because just like we saw, Qi is empty and waits on all things. Now the heart mind as the psycho-spiritual center of human personhood is empty as well. So that's one way to make sense of this. And this relates to the character Jung that I'm translating as align, aligned, alignment, rather than the more standard kind of correct or normal, or however we think about this. Sometimes it's even translated as orthodox in a more contemporary sense of Jungi orthodox unity. Um, from a Taoist perspective, again, thinking about um, Taoist etymology, the top line is E1, but here read as representing heaven, and the bottom part is jur, pause or stop. So stopping, pausing, this key Taoist um, approach or principle, right? Stopping everything that's unnecessary, which is one way of understanding Wu Wei, non-action. So in the larger kind of Taoist tradition, we talk about the four steps or four moments of meditation. Um, Zhang, alignment, postural alignment, Song, uh, relaxation, relaxation of the muscles and the tissues and so on. Jing, stillness that we saw before, and then Ding, uh, stability, concentration, stabilized stillness. So in technical, in the most technical translation, absorption, meditative absorption. And this also connects to the earlier discussion of Tong as pervasion. So there are energetic dimensions of practice, right? We find this in the classical Taoist textual corpus. So Tao Te Ching chapter 42 says, the myriad beings carry yin and embrace yang, it is the empty qi, chong qi, or infusing qi that harmonizes these. Listening stops with the ears, the heart mind stops with joining, but qi is empty and waits on all things. The Tao gathers in emptiness alone. If you can be aligned and still, only then can you become settled, ding, with a stabilized heart mind at the center, with the ears and eyes acute and bright, and with the four limbs firm and stable, you can make a lodging place for vital essence. The vital essence is the essence of qi or the concentration of qi. 
And so here we see in the classical Taoist textual corpus, there's this emphasis on qi and thinking about practice energetically, thinking about experience energetically. And so a different way of understanding, not just the practice, but how to interpret these texts, what they're really about. As I mentioned, woman you, um, sometimes translated as woman crookback, for instance, by Burton Watson, talks about these seven levels of practice or these seven stages. And we just looked at this externalizing the world, externalizing things, externalizing life. So the San Y, the three externalizations, moving into pervading the brightness of dawn, realizing aloneness, Jen Du, um, doing away with past and present, entering where there is no death and no life. So going deeper into this contemplative Taoist practice and how there are different stages, there are different states, they're just different levels of attainment. And this is just one example. And as I mentioned, Kate Towns and I are working on thinking about female Taoist practice. So this would be kind of the beginning of female Taoist practice, as far as we can tell in terms of the historical materials. This then relates to what I refer to as beyond or non-states, Wu, in the Tao Te Ching. It's the most prominent in the Tao Te Ching, but you do have it in the larger classical Taoist textual corpus. And these 12 are listed below. So this is a deeper mapping of the Tao Te Ching. I refer to it as the Wu scale. So going from left to right, top to bottom. So Wu Ming, with literally without name, so namelessness. Wu Qing, this is in the Zhuangzi, um, without emotion or without feeling, emotionlessness. Wu Shi, literally without affairs. So I usually translate this as unconcernedness or non-involvement and so on. So one of the things that we get here looking at it from a contemplative perspective is Wu is beyond. Wu is without this. One is absent of it. So this is a contemplative map of as one goes deeper into the practice, one becomes free or absent of these qualities. So Wu Ming, literally without name. So this relates to um, social identity, reputation, and so on. And increasingly these days, I find myself reflecting on this, right? The relationship between fame and infamy, between kind of uh, grace and disgrace or regracing and all of these kinds of things. And this is really about the perils of being known or letting oneself be known or what people do with one's name. How much is one attached to one's name, especially as it's being constructed and kind of distorted by other people's account. So these are passages, the first three are from the Louds or from the Tao Te Ching, the last one's from the Zhuangzi. So favor and disgrace are like being startled. Reputation or body, which is dear. If I did not have a self, what calamities would I have? And then the Zhuangzi says, fame is a public weapon. So here, Ming, right, is literally one's given, one's given personal name, but it relates to social identity, reputation, fame. And so this is a kind of radically alternative, maybe even subversive view in terms of the modern world, because there's such a kind of chasing after fame wanting to be known to the point of like spiritual exhibitionism and all of these kinds of things. But also this is interesting because it uses shun and shun can mean body. It can also mean self, self in the sense of like one's ordinary self. So that social self. Um, what Taoists are really emphasizing is being um, beyond all of this, right? A alternate reality, if you will, which I would say is reality with an uppercase R, the Tao as reality, a sacred community beyond social acceptance and conformity, beyond respectability, that is in place of so-called disgrace, a uh, regracing, right? So one of the things to be thinking about here is how deeply attached are we to the way that other people define us or the way other people judge us or to what extent are we accepted, right? Because so often being accepted is really based on conformity. So when people talk about respectability, what they're really talking about is, did we do what they wanted us to do? Did we fit into this larger system that tells us this kind of behavior is rewarded, that kind of behavior is punished? So I'm not talking about immorality or amorality. What I'm talking about is a different type of Taoist being, a being that's attuned and aligned with the Tao that isn't concerned with social acceptance, at least in conventional forms. 
So here I think about the American comedian Dave Chappelle. I'm not sure how much you know about Dave Chappelle's story, but specifically when he left Comedy Central and he went to Africa. When he came back, right, so he'd given up a huge amount of money, right, in order to basically say, I just don't want to do this anymore. It doesn't align with who I am. Um, there are other things, right? There are these trappings of fame and there are these problems that come with it, but I just want to be free of it for a while. Um, he says, when he came back, he was interviewed, he says, you can't become unfamous. You can only become infamous. Little did I know what the cancel culture would bring next. And so part of this, that the last part is me commenting on Dave Chappelle. So what happens when one doesn't conform? What happens when one challenges the dominant social order? When one refuses to comply or accept certain kinds of unethical activities on the part of individuals or a system? And so one way to think about this, and I'm almost done, one way to think about this is that a lot of the classical Taoist texts are like basically survival manuals for consensus mind and surreality. They're basically saying, look, this is how the status quo reproduces the system. Um, if you engage in that, this is what will happen to you. And we're telling you there's a different possibility. There's something beyond that. There's something outside of this. So this is why sometimes I think about Taoism as a counterculture, as an intentional community, as a resistance movement or an underground, a spiritual underground, is because they're just different values. And this go also goes into the way that we read and interpret the Tao Te Ching. So if you're interested in going deeper into this, there's a lot of resources that I've compiled and composed. They're on my alternate homepage. So there's the self-study guide to the Tao Te Ching, Tao Te Ching crib sheet, the seven core contemplative chapters of the Tao Te Ching. You know, most of this is obviously in the book as well, but it's just saying, you know, if you are interested in kind of engaging the Tao Te Ching in this radically different way, in a more contemplative way, there's other kinds of materials that you can use. And so finally, I'll just say, you know, rereading the Tao Te Ching again for the first time, this is intentionally paradoxical to say this, because how can you reread a text again for the first time, right? But what I'm pointing to here is the way in which there's a set of assumptions, the received opinions, there's certain kinds of constructions of this text. So most people have already read the Tao Te Ching. So is there a way to overcome that conditioning to kind of reread it or read it again for the first time? So a re-engagement and a reinterpretation. What I'm suggesting is maybe a Taoist contemplative reading, a reading that's Taoist informed, perhaps even Taoist inspired and Taoist infused. And I would say on a deeper level, at least for some people, an approach to the Tao Te Ching that's applied, committed, and lived. And this is an open invitation to you. We're having our 2023 Taoist Studies Summer Seminar through the Taoist Foundation and the Underground University from July 10th to July 14th this year. And it's going to focus on my book, Tao Te Ching, a contextual, contemplative, and annotated bilingual translation, and kind of go through a lot of what I'm talking about here in a deeper way. So, Sabay, thanks. Thanks for listening, and stay well. Take care.